We've got a special treat for you this week as we've remastered and packaged up two of our most popular episodes from 2023. There were always meant to be one episode looking at the venture capital mantra of investing in lines and not dots. Both of these episodes were recorded in March 2023 after my team and I had just completed another 12 investments through Techstars and I was itching to share some of the lessons learned. Owen Fitzgerald set the stage for me to do just that and then we brought Patrick Pinchmid from Middle Game Ventures onto the show two weeks later to dig deeper into this idea of investing in lines and not dots. Let's roll. Money never sleeps, pal. Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. In this episode, Owen Fitzgerald and I take a look at my lessons learned from seeing over a thousand deals in the last year and a bit through Techstars. So we riff on easy to remember mental models, investing in lines, not dots, building relationships with founders, how those relationships evolve post-investment, and the founder having the most credible voice in the room. All right here on Money Never Sleeps. Owen Fitzgerald. That's me. How you doing, pal? How you doing? Ah, sure. I'm not too bad. On this lovely Wednesday morning, as I look out my window. Yeah. It's awful. I've already been outside once, and I won't go outside again until probably about six o'clock. Same. Did the school run. That, that'll be it now, until I do the school run later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I did my walk. And again, I'm listening a lot lately to the On the Brink podcast with Nick Carter and Matt Walsh from Castle Island Ventures, really, really good stuff. And I got a primer on stable coins this morning. And I always like the primer episodes, even though it's something that I may be familiar with already, because you just get all that reinforced and you get that deeper, deeper look yeah. into things. Oh, definitely, definitely. So we'd stick that in the show notes as well. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Like Forrest Gump says, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> But speaking of podcasts, one of the ones I listen to regularly is Invest Like the Best with Patrick O'Shaughnessy. But like that one, I go back to a lot. He has two episodes with Sam Hinkey, who used to be the GM for, or the assistant GM for the Houston Rockets. Yep. And then the GM for the Philadelphia 76ers. And I suppose he's one of the pioneers of analytics in basketball. Daryl Morey was his boss at the Rockets, and he was he's like the main man. If it was a Mount Rushmore, as they call it, it'd be just those two guys on it. Oh, yeah. And he's out now doing his own. He has 87 Capital. It's his own investment fund. But he has two great episodes. And the last one, actually, the more recent one, we'll put both in my show notes. He was, Patrick O'Shaughnessy was interviewing him, obviously, and he was asking him about, you know, any kind of contrarian views he has in relation to venture or things that he would have taken from you know, his basketball learnings and applied to kind of venture. And one thing that struck me was he's like, he doesn't believe in this idea of making kind of a quick decision on somebody. Mm. You know, oh, within the first 10 minutes, you decide I like this founder, I don't like this founder. You know, it kind of struck me because obviously between me and you, like we look at a lot of stuff over the course of a year or over the course of the last number of years. And like that, it's easy to jump to a kind of instant judgment or no, I don't like this. Oh, I'm not sure I like this founder. But he was he's talking about like... Not what he calls breadcrumbs, not only multiple kind of meetings, but like looking at stuff people have put out online or, you know, he even as far back with the companies he's investing in, he goes back and looks at what thesis they did in college and stuff like this. So his is probably to the extreme, but it got me thinking that we might have a chat, particularly about your learnings over the last, because you've gone through the two cohorts now in terms of applications. Yep. And obviously your work with Lego. So that's probably a thousand or more at least. In the last two years alone. That I've looked at deals that I've yeah. have gone through my eyes. That's, that's just on Techstars. And and I remember back a few years ago with other partners trying to get funds off the ground and some of the investors, the f- fund investors that I was talking to was say, were saying, listen, where are you going to get the deal flow from? And I'm like, oh, don't worry, I'll get yeah. it. Right. But <laughs> I, the, the criticality of high volume deal flow is now yeah. baked into my mind. And that you need to put yourself in a position, you need to be out there and talking about what you're doing in order to get deal flow, in order to get people to say, yes, I want, I would like you to invest in what I'm doing. And the, that, that volume that I've seen, you know, that point about Sam Hankey and building relationships and not investing after the first meeting, so critical. The line that, that I keep saying is investors invest in lines, not dots, right? 
<laughs> and if you think of that line that goes up, you need that line to be an increased font or an increased weight. And you find ways to increase the depth and breadth of that line. And so these multiple interaction points that you have, I, I was saying to a founder yesterday, I said, listen, we're in a situation where we just spoke with you for the first time two weeks ago. Usually in this type of setting, we're talking to people four, six, eight weeks ago, and we're having numerous interactions. We're getting to know each other. And what tends to happen is that you can like someone right away, or perhaps you don't. But if you really like their, their, their business, and there's a framework for this, then you're going to talk to them again, regardless of whether you like them or not, right? Because people don't always warm up to people right away. And yep. also, you need to be a student of your own subconscious bias, right? And say, yep. did I like them because they remind me of me? Or did I not like them because they don't remind me of me? Or did I not like them because they do remind me of me? And I see some of my own faults in them, right? So you got to give these things time to develop. But anyway, when I say invest in lines, not dots, having those multiple interaction points, what tends to happen is that you build up over time and you either plateau and you get to the point where, okay, we're seeing eye to eye. We both want to do this. You want me to invest in you. I want to invest in you. Let's do this. Or you get to the point where it's going up and up and up and up, and you can have the similar exact track between two deals, one that you say yes on and one that you say no on, and one of them just crashes and burns because something happens. Because yeah. you're like, oh, I didn't know that. Or they figure out that maybe it's not right for them and it falls to pieces. But if we had pulled the trigger you know, three weeks before that, just on the basis of the first couple of positive interactions, that deal would have fallen apart. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that that's the first thing really is just that these things need to be done with time. And if, in, if, if a startup founder ever gets frustrated because a VC is taking their time, then you kind of do want them to take their time. Yeah, because whilst the, the, fundamentally it's a transaction, <clears throat> like it is a long term relationship, so it can't be transactional. No, even though it is a transaction that you're trying to do ultimately. Yeah. It, it needs to be, it needs to be based on building that relationship and you need to have a framework as well. And seeing the high volume of deal flows does train your brain to think about your framework right off the top of your head. And you need to have the ability to do that. The one that I follow is the one, and when you're investing pre-seed, it's all about team, right? And that it's the four things I look for are team, market, traction, and product or idea. What, what, what are each one of those, right? And when you're having a conversation with someone, generally those conversations start out, they're very, very product heavy. And you need to have the discipline in order, even if you love the product, you need to move into the team. Tell me about how it's constructed. Tell me about the market, your experience in that market. Tell me about how you're doing so far with getting people interested in what you're doing. And you need to have that type of balanced approach and if you're just making decisions based upon hype of a technology or a product and you're not going into depth on the team, you're not going to get anywhere with that. Because I think, I think you can make a quick decision on the opportunity because you might have looked at 10 in a similar market. Yes. And you're like, ah, yes, this one, this one gets it. This one has the opportunity. You know, that's an easy or it's an easier decision to make quickly. Yeah. But yeah. still, obviously, it's, it's, it's the, the team and the, the founder piece take longer. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I've been at a stage where I've got, I'm trying to make a hard decision between three that are all doing kind of the same thing. And I'm making my decisions based upon the team, how much traction they have and how well they know the market. So some of these tells, right? These signals that I look for when I'm talking to a team, Zoom is great for this, right? You can see eyes rolling when one founder is speaking and the other one doesn't like what they're saying. You can hear them talking over each other. Zoom is just so helpful with this because you're looking at both faces at the same time or three faces at the same yeah. time, right? You're also looking for mentorability. Will this person listen to good advice? Will this person know what bad advice is? And are they flexible? Are they self-aware? Do they have that humility to know that they don't have everything and they're not always going to be right? And there are ways to, you know, just the types of questions that you ask around that. And there are, there are questions you might pose to somebody that, 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 you'll like this one 
where if you have a doubt that the founding team has strong commercial ability to execute and to sell, you got to test for that. And I put one founder on the hot seat and said, sell me this messy jersey, right? Um, I had it, my I his pen. <laughs> exactly. I had my son's Lionel Messi jersey, and he, the founder, did a great job because he was asking me questions about, you know, trying to build a relationship with me. He was trying to build a relationship with me and asking me, if, was I a fan of Messi? What football teams did I did I watch? Did I, you know, did I watch the World Cup? What did I think? Blah blah blah. All this type of stuff before he moved in for the sell. I'm like, okay, this founder has some good commercial sensibility around them. Another one I had some doubt on and I said, all right, can we find your killer instinct here? Can we find your kind of overt outward sales chutzpah? And he's like, well, it's not very British, right? And I said, well, let's think of somebody who's a founder that you admire. And he said, Tom Blomfield from Monzo. And I'm like, yes, Tom has this understated technique of influencing people and getting them on board but we know from well at least i know or at least ann bowden represented it this way that you know tom isn't exactly a quiet shy understated guy right he knows what he wants and he's going for it just the way that he comes across is more in line with his own personality there's different ways to look for this and then also with the team itself and especially when you've got you know because we're, we're making a purposeful attempt that we want to bring more female founders into this accelerator program. And that when you see how the male and female of a team interact, and you know there was one, and I don't wanna get into too much detail because I, I don't wanna give it away, but there was one that was like last year, man, that was just, and when I say man, I mean man, in, in the way that he talked to his, his fellow founder who was a female. Really? And it was like, we're not going there. We are not going there. So, you know, you're all- it's hard to test for those kind of some of those kind of traits early on. I find like, you know, trying to figure out someone's kind of like that, their killer instinct mainly or their ability to lead, because obviously they're trying to position things in a particular way, but trying to identify if the founder, you know, has the either the skill set or, you know, the perseverance to kind of make it work. Yep. That's where the market is so critically important as well. Does that founder have deep firsthand experience in that market? Do they know the market? Not only do they know the market, but do they know the channel they're going down? If they're going down a B2B channel, do they have B2B experience? If they're going down B2C, do they have B2C experience? If they're going B2B2C, man, that's really hard. So do they have experience with that? And these are all questions you can ask. You can look at people's LinkedIn profiles only to a certain extent. You've got to ask the question, You've got to bring in other people to help you vet them. You've got to even, you know, I know one investor that just randomly will call people that, you know, say, oh, hey, I saw on your LinkedIn profile, you might have worked with so-and-so in the past. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. And sometimes he gets some, some information. Sometimes he gets, you know, a, a hang up, right? I like that. You need more, as, as Sam Hinkie calls it, breadcrumbs or data points. You do. Because like that, you're, you know, your line is not up and to the right. It's not a straight line. It's lots of, lots of dots leading in a particular direction. Yeah. All pieces that you know, help you make that decision. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely critical. And it's like that line that's going up and up having other investors, mentors that I know well, talk to these founders just to get that different perspective is so critical. And you may catch someone on a good day. You may catch someone on a bad day. Then they have another conversation and it can flip. Also, you need to be very aware when you're investing globally of the impact of getting people at a bad hour right? You may have a terrible conversation with someone because it's two in the morning. And that was the only time slot that you could do. And because they're thinking about, well, I, I want to work with this investor, they may agree to do something at 2.30 in the morning. And people are night owls sometimes, maybe they're not. Or you get them for a first great conversation in the middle of the day. And then, you know, in the middle of the night, things just fall to pieces. And well, give them a chance and talk to them again on their normal hours. But you can always get people at a bad hour. And that's one thing you got to be very careful of when you're investing globally. And just be mindful and respectful of what time it is in other time zones, right? Always got to do that. Tell me this, you know, we read and absorb a huge amount of stuff from the more traditional VC world and then trying to 
fit that into our own kind of particular investing or our businesses investing kind of philosophy? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been interesting. And, and this is, you know, I mean, Techstars, the Techstars way is team, 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 market traction idea, right? And that is ingrained into my head. Now, you know, it's, to me, it's team market traction idea. And I can have a conversation around that. And the ability to do that, like I said, only comes from repetition. And so yep. thank you to Hugh McGurr, the investment principal on the Techstars Web3 program with me, who could continually pounds this into my head, these four things we need to look for, we need to test for, right? So you need to have that framework. And I remember in the prepping for demo day last year, though, that it changes. So when you make your initial investment decision, when you're doing pre-seed, you can use those four criteria. But then when you're testing how well that they're presenting themselves for investment from others, you need to go back to your 10, right? And I'm not going to rattle all of them off because I'm not going to get them all. Let's see if I can, okay? <laughs> Vision, problem, solution, market that you're selling into, your go-to-market plan, your team, your traction, your competition, your... Roadmap. Your roadmap. I only, I only, I only say that because I have them here in front of me. <laughs> you sent them to yeah. me before; they're on my screen. <laughs> and the ask, right? Yeah. And you need, you need to have all ten of those. So when I was doing last year the demo day preparation with and having people pitch over and over and over again until they had it down cold, I was testing for all ten of those things. Now we don't do the ask in a tech stars pitch because that's investor solicitation. But, yep. you you know, that follows up afterwards. But, the, you know, so it, it comes down to nine. And that's when you shift gears a bit. So when, you, when you're going to bring somebody in, you're doing it based upon these four key criteria. But then when you're going to actually help socialize this deal to other investors, you need to hit a lot more criteria, right? Because they're going to be tested on a lot more at a seed stage or getting that first round done than it would have been when I'm investing pre-seed. Right. And I was saying this to, to someone yesterday that I always feel like if you want to master your level, you need to master yeah. the level one step before you. And that's angel, right? Angel investing. And that's why I'm such a student of folks like Jason Calacanis, read his book, did his angel course online. And, you know, I, I would like to even get further in depth there. You know, Hugh McGurr said to me, well, Pete, think about that, but also think about Series A. Right. What is it yeah. that we need to help founders master themselves based upon how Series A invest, right? And how true seed stage investors invest as well. And And actually that's that's an interesting point because I was gonna one of the things I was gonna ask was, you know, it it flips, especially obviously with the Techstars model. You do this very intense period of work with these companies, obviously you evaluate them in detail, then you work with them very closely. But then there must be a big shift in the, the nature of the relationship even on the other side. There is. And that was when I was picking out my, you know, my few lessons learned here. There, there is that point of that shift that you get your lines, not dots. Have your framework critical, you know, and whatever that is, whatever that works for you is something that needs to be baked into your mind that you can do that you can reach to and use over and over again in the course of a conversation cold. Have the multiple interaction points, lines, not dots, absolutely critical. Then you kind of get into the fold with somebody. After you've made that investment decision, the thing about running an accelerator program is that you've got those 13 weeks after you've made the investment decision to really get them moving and get them moving faster, yeah. i.e. the term accelerator, right? But there is that shift. You're getting to know each other. You're trying to figure it out. You're always trying to be in a position of not saying, hey, tell me what you're doing today or give me an update on the business over the last week. But what can I help you with today? How can I help unlock some value? How can I help make an introduction? What is the main thing that you're worried about today that I might be able to help you with today? Send me your email update, please, and I'll read that on how everything's going. But let's concentrate our focus on helping to get you moving in the right direction on what you're struggling with today, right? which is the sometimes the hardest thing to do because you're always looking for more context, always looking for more information. But th that shift from 
all right, we're, we're, we've made the decision. The money's in the bank. We're moving forward with this. We need to get you and then bridge you logically and learning wise to getting that first round going. It's a whole different mentality and shifting into how people think about raising money from VCs Definitely. and this investor pipeline methodology, methodology that I teach. And with, again, a shout out to Jenny Fielding, who's, whose method it is that I've just fallen in love with, the, the method, not Jenny. Uh, and well, Jenny is a rock star. I'll give her that. And, but it's, it's a process that you go through and you need to do deep, deep, deep research. The biggest thing is if you're getting tons of no's from investors, sometimes that's right. It's, you know, that you, you should be getting a no. Other times it's that you've researched the wrong investors. You are not yeah. attacking the right list. You're not hammering that right list to make sure you can get intros to all those people. And I'm going to help with those intros and Techstar is going to help with those intros, but you need to do the work to identify who are the right investors for you. You always need to be in the mindset that investing in my business should be a freaking pleasure for investors. This is the best deal they're ever going to have. Now you don't say that and you don't carry yourself that way because that's incredibly arrogant and you're going to upset a lot of people. But you need to be looking at the investor landscape as if you're a crazy salesperson targeting customers. Who are the customers you really, really want to have that are going to be strategic for you? They're going to help you to get other customers. Who are going to be the investors you're going to, you're going to build a great, strong relationship with that's going to help you get other investors and help you with a whole bunch of different things in your business? That's a mindset you need to have. So when you start thinking about building your investor pipeline, it needs to be done on the basis of, who are the ones that I think I'm really going to build a great relationship with that I'm really going to like? They're going to like me. We perhaps have something in common. You got to do a ton of research around that. And that's that's no small piece of work. And you just got to start attacking that. And that is that is the shift. And that is the shift from we've made an investment to how do we actually get others to invest in this business as well? And it's a two-way street because you can teach someone, you really want to be able to teach someone to fish. You know, and yeah. and and that you're not going to hand anything to anybody on a silver platter, other than a warm intro, right? If the person that's the, the the founder that's asking for an introduction has proven to me that yeah, this is an investor that they really want, and here's why, because then I can go to that investor with tons more conviction, because I'm not going to introduce a deal to a VC that I know that VC is not interested. In that kind of deal, no matter how well I know Mike Brennan from Finch Capital, I'm not going to introduce pre-seed stage deals to him because he does not invest pre-seed. And now, no matter how much of a nice guy Mike is and how much I like him and, and that he and I have known each other for years, I'm just not going to do that because it's course, it's a waste yeah. of his time and it's a waste of my time. And it's a waste of the founder's time doing the research and getting excited about the fact that I know Mike. Right. So, you know, yeah. it, it's. The, the, that, is, that is such a big, massive part of it. You know, I, I think going along with that, that you definitely have to be supportive. And that's part of why I love doing this is that I love working with founders, full stop, right? I love working with early stage founders and I love the upside as well, right? Which is, which is critically yeah. important. So there's, I'm incentivized to be supportive and I'm a naturally helpful person. So that is good as well, but you got to let them stumble. You got to let them make their mistakes because it's the only way that people learn is through making the mistakes themselves. If you know, and, and you can't go on every pitch with them, you can't, you should probably shouldn't go as an investor. It's an early stage investor. Yeah. You can't because it, the founder's voice is the most credible voice in the room. You know, you need to let them do it. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I have a whole list of things that I, that I had written down. I was like, oh, we must chat about that. And we must, I must ask that. Go, go for it. Sh- even, no, I was going to say that like there's so much we, we should really bring it on to a second call. Yeah. And you know what would be good is to do this with another investor. Yeah, definitely. You know, and- you mentioned a few and I know we have a couple lined up. Someone probably coming at in a more traditional VC role, but maybe not with a traditional background. Because, you know, lots of people from lots of different backgrounds end up investing. It's always interesting to see what they t- what they take from their previous life into it. Yeah, yeah, and just to bring it back, it's deal flow. It's all deal flow. Yep. I remember sitting down with a VC in 2019, and with one of the last VC projects I tried to get off the ground, and that investor said to me, "Pete, you're not going to get the deal flow. 
with this strategy, you will not get that deal flow for the geography you're looking to do. I said, yeah. and, and it's so true. And getting deal flow is not just about market dynamics and where people are and where they're starting up, but it's about your presence in the market. You can't just sit back on your laurels and wait for people to come to you. You got to go out and find people. You got to go out and get them. And that's, and, and, you know, it, it's not a tap that you can just turn on. You need to do a lot of work in order to get yourself in a position where if you go out and you start speaking to the world that people listen yep. and you, you get that audience and, and people are like, okay, well, yeah, that I, it, you know, having a podcast helps. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I always love to talk to other investors about this because you just can learn so much from a simple conversation. That's it. You can learn so much. And like we said last week, that that one chat or that blog post from Finn Murphy from a few years ago that just crystallized that for me of every investment you make needs to be done on the basis that it will be a home run, that you will get 100x. As an investor, you will get 100 times your investment back because you might, out of every 30 investments you make, you might get two, if you're lucky, one that would be that home run that would return your fund. So we'll have to watch this space to see which one of your 26 is the home run. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully the all odds, of them. The odds are starting to be in your favor the more you do. Well, that's the thing. With it, what, what, what is it? 95% of startups fail. And by putting them through a program the first 13 weeks and building that relationship and building that trust, you can hopefully get things to a position where you have, you're lowering those odds. You're lowering those odds of failure. Yeah. You're increasing the odds of success. And that's what, that's just what I try to do. All you can do. Yep. Brilliant. All right. Well, let's see who we can get on to have a further chat about this. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. (laughs) Take it easy. Adios. On the show this week, we've got Patrick Pinchman, who is a general partner and co-founder at Middle Game Ventures, a financial technology venture capital fund focused on early stage investments in Europe. Previously, Patrick was a Deputy Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he served as the first Executive Director of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Prior to his government service, Patrick spent a decade as a sell-side financial institutions and capital markets analyst, where he was a lead analyst at Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch for the brokers, exchanges, and financial technology sector. He's a grad at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and Columbia University's Graduate School of Business. In this episode, Patrick and I dive into the life experiences that delivered him to venture capital before we talk through Middle Game Ventures' Irish Seed Fund and what he looks for in fintech founders. We also get into Patrick's lessons learned as an investor, how he looks at deals, investing in lines, not dots, and the human focus of early stage investing. All right here on Money Never Sleeps. Thrilled to be having this chat with you. And I look back in my calendar to see when you and I actually first met. And I knew it was at Matt the Threshers, which is on Pembroke Street in Dublin, but it was actually September 3rd, 2018. Nearly five wow. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, well Pete, it, it, it's great to be on and sorry Owen couldn't join, but yeah, that, that's right. You and Owen were kind of there when I started making footprints in Dublin, kind of talking to different ecosystem folks. And I guess, I guess what's typically done is, oh, you should talk to this other yank called Pete Townsend. <laughs> and I think that's how I ended, ended up in your tracks. Yeah, that was my Santa Maria. So shout out to Mai. Thank you, Mai, yeah, for introducing yeah. us. Thank you, Mai. Yeah. She's awesome. So let's get started with just... Give us a rundown, an intro into into Patrick Pinchmit and how you got to this point with with what you're up to and what that is. So I'm with Middle Game Ventures, we're an early stage fintech VC focusing on the on the European market. And I, I guess about five years ago, I started scouting Europe for for another office for us. We were based in Luxembourg, and we were close to launching our first fund. And I was spending time in Ireland talking to potential LPs, talking to, to, to folks in the ecosystem, talking to startups. And for a host of reasons, I decided to push forward with Ireland. And, and that's kind of how I ended up here talking to you. So I, I, I guess to, to give some context, my entire career has been spent in financial services. I, I started out on the sell side research at, at Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley as a research analyst covering banks, asset managers, exchanges, and financial technology before it was called FinTech. 
And, you know, this was pre-crisis and it was a very interesting time, obviously a lot of growth and then a lot of pain with the, the advent of the crisis. And I had an opportunity coming out of that crisis to return to Washington. I'd, I'd gone to school in Washington, D.C. and, you know, always had an interest in, in, in public policy and, 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 and getting involved at some stage. And, you know, the stars had never really aligned for a host of reasons, including, you know, I'm a, a Democrat and there wasn't really a Democratic administration in the early 20- 2000s. That makes a lot of sense. But listen, wanted to really hear more from you about the fund as well. When you and I first met Patrick back in 2018, I had just parked the second of four venture capital fund launch that I had been involved with between 2016 and 2021 and was unknowingly moving on to my third unsuccessful project to get a fund launched. You guys have done well in getting your foothold into the Irish market with the Irish Focus Fund. Maybe tell us a bit about the strategy for investing in Ireland and how you've gone about that and what some of the learnings are. Yeah, as I noted at the the onset here, when we we set up the fund, we we, we all got together in 2017. My my two partners came out of a fairly large fund, but through a family office structure. So they kind of came at this with a significant track record and had some strong operational experience. And you know, my background was a little bit more, well, obviously, on, on the regulatory side as well as on the incumbent financial services side. And I, I think, it, as you know, Pete, when, when you're setting up a fund, it, it's, it's you know, the, the, uh, you, you can kind of dream and, and a lot is possible. And it's only when you get the capital, you can kind of actually do things. And so at that stage, I, you know, through talking and getting to know my my, my partners, we decided to make a run at it and, you know, I joined up with them in 2017 and then, you know, fast forward two, three years after a lot of fundraising, we, we set up the fund and, and we decided to have a European fintech focus because we believed we could, as three partners, that would maximize our kind of leverage in the European market, given our touch points in the U.S. as well as across Europe. And, you know, being fintech specialists too, that would be something differentiated and we thought would be welcome. And initially, you know, coming to Ireland, you know, clearly there's some interesting fintechs. We, we had a support of Enterprise Ireland and some other LPs. And, 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 you know, generally speaking, obviously Dublin airport's easy. The rest of the continent's relatively easy to get to. It's a good jumping off point to the rest of the continent. But, you know, I think what has surprised us is the amount of activity and, and, and the quality of a lot of the, the startups. And uh, yeah, we, we've done six investments through the fund that was launched in 2019. And, you know, kind of through those touch points, we, we realized, well, you know, there's a way here to get involved actually earlier. And, uh, you know, the legacy fund is more of a series A focused fund. And we decided, well, you know, we should start talking to people at, at, at the seed stage level and, and really kind of get in on the ground floor. And, and that's what motivated us to pursue a, a seed fund. But again, I think where we sit, we're in the fortunate position of being a fintech specific fund that can help startups scale commercially, whether it's across Europe and into the US through a strategic partnerships or help with subsequent funding rounds or, or even the current funding round by bringing in other investors, you know, we, they're either within the Irish market or outside the Irish market. But, you know, fintech is a little bit of a, a different animal. And I, I think sometimes it helps to have a, an investor on board who can help validate and help, you know, really take a hands-on role in, in helping bring other investors in and then help that business scale as it moves forward. Definitely, definitely. And what are what are some of the basic metrics in terms of check size and, you know, the kind of traction that you look for and those types of things? So we'll, we'll invest from seed through series B across both fund vehicles, you know, specifically at the seed level. So it's sort of the, you know, at, at the, the sort of the more mature level, we'll, we'll, we'll put in, you know, we'll go up to 7 million, but at the seed level, we can go as low as 250, 300, and we'll probably max out at a little over 1 million. And, you know, obviously, as you know, Pete, at, at, at the seed level, it's really all about team and technology and product, you know, traction is great, but it's, it's, it's sort of optional, but you know, if, if there's some evidence of traction, you know, we'll, we'll take that, but you know, we're really trying to understand is, is, is this a, you know, a, a, a backable team and a, a backable solution. And, you know, is there, there's something we can kind of help move along. And I think that, you know, the one metric we, we try to hit, adhere to in terms of our engagement is just have as many meetings as possible, get to know the founder and the founding team. 
and, you know, really understand what vertical they're going after. And, you know, if everything adds up, then let's, you know, try and move forward together. I gotcha. Yeah. And that was one of the big lessons learned that Owen and I talked through when he asked me about what I thought from the first thousand deals that I've looked at through Techstars. And it was investors invest in lines, not dots. And like you said, have as many engagements, interactions as you can with people, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that's absolutely right. And you'll never regret taking another meeting in a startup you're interested in because you always learn something more. And it's not just the founder and the CEO. It's who does that person surround him or herself with? You know, what's the quality of their their, their team? What's the interaction like? And it's a learning journey. I mean, we're not trying to torture people, but you, you do need to invest the time. And it's frankly, it's, you know, the, the founder needs to invest the time also because when, when you, you know, a seed investor comes on, I mean, that's generally going to be kind of a long relationship and there'll be many twists and turns and there'll, there'll probably be, you know, hopefully good times, but there'll be some uncomfortable conversations and some difficult choices along the road. And, and, and you know, you, ideally, if you're in a position where you can pick your investors, you know, it's important that the startup does that due diligence also because, you know, while you know, capital is capital and that's important. You also want a strategic capital to help, you know, really be a partner as the founder grows the business. Yeah, definitely. And what you just said there is critically important. Pick your investors, right? And that, it, you know, what I say to founders is you need to go out and do the research on your market in the same degree or with the same degree of voraciousness as the craziest salesperson you've ever met researches their target customers, right? And that you need to understand investors and you need to understand, is it, you know, do they even invest in my stage? Are they writing the check size? Are they investing in this thematic that I'm involved with? And there's so many things that go into this that a lot of founders, sometimes when they're new to fundraising, they think, well, oh, they must not like me. They must not like me at all. And usually as from an investor perspective, it's me, it's not you, you know, and, and that you've got investors behind you, right? That you've signed up. And that they've agreed to certain covenants and requirements and terms and so on and so forth that when you talked about the check size and what rounds you're going to invest in, that's because you've made some representations to investors, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And so going through your first funding round can be quite painful and an emotional experience for, for all parties involved because the lawyers tend to take over and, you know, obviously... Uh, key goal of both parties is to you know, kind of limit the, the, the pain and time and money that's spent on that process. But, you know, that, that is table stakes for, for taking institutional money. And I think that's, you know, the first question a founder should ask him or herself is, you know, do, do I need venture capital? It, you know, because, you know, there are frankly a lot cheaper ways to fund your business and a lot less dilutive. And, and, and some businesses, you know, may, it, that may not be the right choice. And uh, that's kind of like that, that threshold question. And the other thing is, you know, don't necessarily wait to your need capital to start talking to investors. And it, it's, you know, I, I think there are a lot of founders out there and, you know, I think VCs are just as guilty of this is, you know, waiting until a startup is in the market and, and then the, the outbound and the inbound. You know, I, I think the most valuable thing is, you know, having a conversation with a founder a year before they're raising capital. And, and you, know, you know, not to give away kind of our secrets is, you know, you get a lot from that conversation. You, you understand, you, you, you kind of develop a compass in terms of what they're trying to do with the business. And you, you have a much more productive follow-up conversation, whether that's six months later or 12 months later, and you you kind of have your 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 check marks and your and your map to kind of gauge that conversation with. And you know, I Pete, I'm I'm actually reminded of, you know, back in the pre-COVID days when I was over here. I think you introduced me to a, a great founder, David Heath, yep. the CEO of Circuit. And I, I guess it was 2018 or 29. It's probably 2019. You know, I, I I met with him, and you know, obviously Circuit very impressive in terms of what they're creating. A confirmation platform for the audit space and 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 much more now today. But you know, frankly, it was very early days, and you know, I didn't necessarily understand or appreciate you know the market opportunity. But and 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 we you know we didn't invest at that stage. But you know, he came back and we we talked you know a year ago, and you know he executed on everything he said he would three years prior. And, and then some, and, you know, it made it a very easy decision to decide to, you know, co-lead the series A when that hit the market early last year. 
because we we, we kind of had that reference point from from two three years prior. And again, this is somewhat of an extreme example because there was a three year gap between conversations. But you know, again, it's you know just getting in the conversation. And, you know, if, if nothing else, be selfish about that. You know, obviously the, the, the VC is being selfish in the sense of wanting to know you and, and, you know, quote unquote, develop a cheat sheet for follow-up conversations. But the startup founder should be selfish too, in terms of, you know, testing the VCs, getting a sense for, you know, what they can do in terms of introductions, what can they do in terms of help, you know, and, 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 and kind of, you know, getting your, your, your pitch together. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. David is a great founder. Shout out to David Heath. Absolutely. He's close enough to me neighborhood wise, but I know he's been quite intensely focused on even scaling circuit to, a, you know, to a huge degree recently. So I, you know, the, one of the interesting things about, I, I think thinking back a few years is that, you know, it was a different landscape back then pre COVID. And I remember reading something on your website, on the middle game ventures website that I'm like, I totally identified with. And I saw some of you know, what Circuit was doing in in what you guys were interested in investing in. And, you know, there's a lot to that name, middle game, right? And I know, I think it's Pascal, your partner, who is a big fan of chess, isn't he? That's right. That's right. And the middle game is, is a chess term and not a, a gaming term. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There's the, be, there's the beginning game, there's the end game in chess, and it's how you execute in the middle game that is critically important. And, you know, I think that resonates with both the stage of where you're investing in that you've got to get them to the middle game and that at that point they're raising capital from instead of the up to 7 million range, they're raising it up to 50 to 100 million range. But also then looking at the financial markets and fintech and how all that's unfolded and seeing that there's so much opportunity in what happens in the middle of finance right? And that there's so many opportunities to provide new solutions in there that can just make the global financial system operate smoother. And it's always hard when you're trying to invest in things that are bringing costs down rather than creating new revenue. But if you have the right approach and you've got people who are experienced in that space, they could tell the ones that are really going to make a difference in the middle game versus those that will just be afterthoughts, right? Yeah, that, uh, that's very articulate and, and, and well well stated. Yeah, yeah, we, we should have you help us with our, our coffee <laughs> on our website. <laughs> I could pull these things out of thin air sometimes, Patrick. So <laughs> that's all that for what it's worth. Yeah. But but thinking thinking about as I mentioned earlier, Owen and I did have that chat. We talked about the lessons learned. We talked about investors investing in lines, not dots, and you're clearly speaking to that in this conversation we're having right now, are there any models that you apply yourself in terms of the first conversations that you're having with founders? And what are some of the, the signals that you look for? Obviously not giving it all away, right? You don't want people, you know, acting to, 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 to cover off what you and I are talking about right now in terms of the conversation is going to have with you. But I have this, you know, team market traction product that I work into every conversation. And I try to tick all four of those boxes and make it a natural conversation. When you have that natural conversation, things tend to come out of the wash. Anything that you try to follow to keep things moving smoothly when you're chatting with with founders? Yeah, yeah. No, I think your your framework is, is spot on. I mean, the, the earlier the company, the, the more focus on team and technology. The later stage the company, the more focus on on product market fit and and the ability to scale. And, and then kind of anything in between comes in between. And, you know, I, I think that the challenge is, uh, you know, when you're in the market and you're investing across Europe and, and you're looking at early stage startups, you're, you're going to talk to a lot of people. And the, the, the challenge is to kind of arrive at some quick no's and, and, and then also be able to decide which are the ones you want to follow up with and spend more time on because... I think the biggest challenge for an investor is 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 prioritizing one's time, and, and in order to help do that, and I'm not saying we always get it right, is to you know have a view on kind of you know what are the sectors that are most promising, and understand which startups are operating in, in that environment, and you know try and get in front of them earlier than than you you need to to develop a relationship to become smarter on that sector, but also to understand what individual startups are are doing. And and then, you know, obviously 
when you have that first conversation, it, it's really getting a sense for that founder and, you know, particularly at the seed level, because, you know, whenever they show you on your deck, you know, we talk about reference points and, and, and kind of, you know, building a map, whatever they show you on that deck, it, it's rarely going to come to fruition, whether it's a financial statement or the business plan, there are going to be a lot of pivots. The, the, the hockey stick will be flattened a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's just a given, but it's understanding kind of the resilience of the founder and, and the ability to kind of bob and weave as the market, you know, punches you in the face or, 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 or things happen and, and you have to pivot. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the holy grail of founders is that vision, that strategic vision to sort of see a, a market opportunity and, and then develop the technology or the solution to take advantage of that opportunity. But, but that's just one part of it. The other part, which is not as sexy is, you know, having that operational discipline to build a team and to set near term and medium term and longer term goals and hold people accountable day in and day out. And uh, yeah, that's more of a grind. And, and, and that's the lonely part of the founder's journey. And, you know, that's very difficult to assess based on our first meeting. And, you know, obviously that's where it kind of comes into play. Well, you know, does the CEO have certain strengths and are, and does, does he or she have certain weaknesses and, you know, how does the team complement or exacerbate that? And, you know, I think frankly, there, you know, there've been a few times where I think we talked to a very interesting founder, a very promising founder, and then you talk to the rest of the team and you're wondering, well, what, what kind of team is this person building? So, you know, there can be some, you know, false positives, negative positives, or positive negatives, or however you want to phrase that. But, you know, you, you get that with discussions, but the, the initial sort of fork in the road is, is, you know, trying to make quick decisions as to, is this a startup or a vertical you want to spend more time on? And, and then don't be shy about following up and you know, having as many touch points as possible. Do, do you guys, do you, do you default to and fall back on specific areas within fintech where you know that you're going to be able to con- not necessarily contribute the most, but at least stay on top of things the most and being able to point people in the right direction and make introductions for them after the investment? Yeah. And so, so that's, you know, the, the good thing about FinTech, it's, it's a very broad space and there, there are multiple different verticals. You know, I, I think as a, a practice and, a, you know, sort of kind of consistent with our investment themes, we're, we're very much B2B focused and you know, I don't think we've done anything direct to consumer. Yeah. You know, there may be a little bit of that, but it's not a, a primary driver of any of the businesses we've invested in. Which is not to say there aren't good B2C companies out there. It's just, you know, that's less core to our expertise. I mean, we come come from the institutional world and financial services. But you know, I, I think generally speaking, you know, we we wanna invest in 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 founders and teams where, you know, we can be involved, we can roll up our sleeves, we can take a board seat, we can, you know, leverage our network and you know, our you know, our our core areas of expertise are in that incumbent space, obviously in the regulatory space. And, and that's the, 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 the thing to remember here is FinTech is a lot different than some of these other tech verticals. It, it's been a late, relatively late bloomer. And I think you talked about that, that middleware and, you know, when you're talking about middle game yeah. and, 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 and that's, you know, back in the late nineties, I mean, the back, back in the late two, 2009, 2010, 2011, you saw that front end being digitized. Now we're kind of in that middleware being digitized and, and, and then, you know, and, and we're slowly starting to see it in the core. And the way I like to kind of explain that is, you know, again, sort of using my old cell side research hat here when, you know, I, was, I used to cover the exchange space and, and it was going electronic and, you know, the, the sort of the life cycle of, you know, taking an instrument that was traded, let's say, on the, on the NYMEX or on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and putting that on a screen is very compelling because you're essentially digitizing it and you're making it, you're taking out the friction, you're reducing the costs. And so, so therefore you get more volume, you, you, you rewire it, you expand access and, and, and you lower costs. And those are all the factors we're seeing in financial services as we think about it being digitized, taking out the friction, reducing the costs, expanding access. 
And you know, out of that, they're going to come a host of new products. And you, you see that with companies like Wavefly, or you see that with companies like Circuit, the, the startups that are able to sort of connect the dots and build digital ecosystems and new models that didn't exist previously. And, and, and that to us is, is, is the real big opportunity. And you can kind of start going down some of the different verticals, whether it's in capital markets, asset management, or, or open finance, open banking. But that to us is what gets us really excited. And you know, the opportunity here is, is immense because unlike other, you know, if you're talking about a, a Google or a Microsoft or even a, a Meta, those aren't the same type of companies in terms of their ability to innovate as banks. Uh, mm-hmm. Banks are, are very poor innovators. They, they, they can't attract the talent. They can't retain the talent. And even if they had the technology, they wouldn't necessarily be able to pioneer it. So they have the assets, but they're always going to look for a partner on the outside to, to sort of implement and drive that technology forward. And, and, and it's great for, for us as investors and, and, and participants in the fintech space because, you know, there, there's a partner there and, and there's an investor there and there's a potential exit there. And, you know, I, our, our role is, 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 is driven a lot by helping, you know, particularly companies in Ireland where, you know, that the local incumbent infrastructure isn't as developed as, let's say, the UK or in the US is, is providing them the touch points to help test their product and help scale their product with, with other companies. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you touched on a critical point there in, in that, you know, looking at the financial systems and seeing opportunities to improve the killer word there or killer phrase you use is increase volumes and grow volumes, increase throughput and the ability to just unlock and remove this friction allows revenue to be created. And it's not just, okay, we're making the machine work better. It's that what you can build on top of that better version of the machine in order to sell more, right? And sell more financial products. And it's, yeah, I, lo- I love the way that, that you pull that all together. Is thinking about, Patrick, the, you know, your journey itself or your journey yourself that you and I talked about this once is that, you know, stepping into venture capital that, you know, there are all different ways that you can find a reference point for the world that you are stepping into. And whether that's podcast, whether that's reading, whether that's whatever, there there are ways to do it. But I think what you said to me that time is that only way to really learn it is to do it, right? Have have there been some surprises to you about what you thought the world of venture capital was going to look like before you got into it based upon what you've seen over the last few years? Yeah, no, I mean, as you know, that there, there really is no manual to, to, to being a, a good early stage investor. And I, I think, you know, obviously the table stakes are understanding the markets you're investing in and, and then, you know, having that compass to, you know, prioritize your time. But I, you know, look, I, I think in terms of kind of the, the, the lessons learned is, you know, I think you, you have to constantly be curious. You know, you have to, you know, you have to constantly be talking to people. You have to constantly be challenging your assumptions. And it's, it's also good to surround yourself with, with partners who kind of look at the world maybe through a different lens. And, you know, so you kind of, you know, the, the sum is greater than the, the, the individual parts in terms of, you know, making a decisions and, and, and challenging different areas of where to play in. And, you know, I, I think, you know, that that's in, in finding deal flow and, 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 and making the decision there. But, you know, frankly, you know, if, if we're doing our job and we're succeeding as investors, you know, 90% of the time we'll be just a supporting actor in, in, in a startup's journey. And, you know, it's the founder that's driving that. And we just have to make sure that that person and that team, you know, has all the tools that, that they might need or might not know they need to, in order to be successful. And, you know, I think we'll, we'll you know, what, what, what I learned is, you know, a, a lot of your, your, your best performing companies from a, I guess, returns perspective to LPs are, are not always the ones you spend the most time on. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's the ones that, you know, have to engineer a pivot or, you know, have, have really hit up against the wall in terms of their product or their marketplace. And, you know, a, a lot of gratification, at least from the investor side, 
you know, it's also a lot of pain on both sides, but, you know, helping that founder kind of navigate that journey and hopefully, you know, finding a way out of a particular predicament and securing some sort of path that gives that startup some momentum that wasn't there before. I mean, there, there's a lot of satisfaction on that. So, so when I look back on kind of what we've been able to accomplish over the last three or four years, I mean, sure, you know, you'd love every investment to be a 10x and and more, but you know, that there are ones that are you know less than that, but would have been a lot less had we not been able to help. And you know, there's a lot of satisfaction from that. And you know, I just from a personal standpoint. Yeah, you know, I I've been lucky to spend my entire career in financial services, you know, doing it from the research analyst side and then the regulatory side. But, you know, when you're investing, it's basically you're you're wearing a different hat every day and, you know, every hour of the day it's a different hat and, you know, you have to transition very quickly from looking at startups to, you know, helping with the board to dealing with lawyers and it's not always fun and exhilarating, but the arc of it is extremely gratifying and, you know, getting to have different touch points along a founder's journey. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I, what you asked what surprised me, and I've kind of gone about this in a long roundabout way. I have so much admiration and awe for, for, for a startup founder. You know, I've never been a founder. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, that's probably not a great thing, but you know, I've done other things. And, you know, I think being a founder takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of persistence and, you know, and, and it, it, it's, it's quite a lonely journey in the sense that, you know, there aren't that many other people who you can talk to and kind of bounce ideas off of. And, you know, if we can kind of be a resource along that road, I, I think we're, we're doing a good job and that, that, that's, that's been a key learning. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, empathy and humanity can go a long way right? In that it, it's, it's crazy with this investment process, this investment framework that it's, hey, we're investing in people, right? At the earliest stages, you're investing in people, like you said, you know, a little while ago, and that it's that when one of these fails, it's heartbreaking because you're so emotionally involved because not only are you trying to be an advisor and you are an investor, but you're also a fan right? You really want this founder to succeed. On the other end, when you see someone just killing it over and over and over again, it's like, well, how can I help? You know? And yeah. sometimes it's just, it's not what you know. It's not, have you been through this before? It's not, how have you dealt with this challenge? It's that, who can you introduce me to? And that's not always the, hey, an investor and, you know, another investor help me build out this round. It's just, like you said, someone else that you know that's been through this because you've got that network, you've got that experience that can be have a incredibly helpful conversation with one of the founders you invested in, you know, and and that humanity, that empathy for people is what makes all the difference for me in this space, you know. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's a a, a key thing because you know you're going to see founders in a lot of different positions in terms of what they're going through. And it's the, the euphoria of that first check in the door, whether it's a funding round or your first big commercial customer. And and then there'll be, you know, other twists and turns and, and just, you know, being able to devote the time and being a resource and, you know, creating actually a, a, a space where you can have that dialogue with a founder. There are founders who, who don't like to say anything negative and 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 want to kind of keep everything rosy even when the opposite is happening behind the scenes. So, you know, obviously we're not doing our job if if we can't have that open, honest communication because I think that's the best for all parties. Definitely. And and sincerely, Patrick, that's why you make such a great mentor on the Techstars Web3 program because you've got that, you know, that humanity and that empathy. So thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you. Listen, we're at the point of the chat where I know that if Owen was here, he would ask his favorite final famous question that we ask everybody on this podcast, Patrick Pinchmidt. What is one thing that people would not expect to know about you? Well, I, I, I guess, Pete, from, from one American to a, another American, <laughs> I, I, I guess, you know, I, I think when I meet a lot of people in, in town that they sort of assume I was kind of airdropped into Dublin several years ago. But but the truth is, I you know I'm actually half Irish, and my parents live in a small village in, in County Limerick. So yeah, 
I, take that. <laughs> I, I I knew that. I knew that, but most most people did not. And it's the name Pinchmid that would would yeah, not yeah. give that away. Yeah. So it's 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 Patrick O'Dwyer Pinchmid. If we're okay. going to use my mom's maiden name. <laughs> All right. All right. And no. And you know there there's a good good crew of of folks that you know over the years have dropped into. Ireland that, and I mean, it's just what makes this community here of people coming at things from all different angles, including our friend, Kurt Pittman, shout out to Kurt. He's a, he's from New Zealand, right? So yeah. there's, you know, the, the good bunch of people. Anyway, listen, Patrick, thank you so much for coming onto the show. We got into such a great chat here. This is one that we could keep going and I know we'll keep going with, you know, over the years. So thank you again. And I really appreciate you doing this with us. Thank you, Pete, for having me on and I look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you. That does it for this week, folks. Thanks to Patrick Pinchmid for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. You can learn more about Patrick and Middle Game Ventures in the show notes on our website, moneyneversleeps.ie. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify as it helps others to find the show. Thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode. Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm an early stage startup investor focused on where fintech meets crypto and crypto meets Web3, and I run the Techstars Web3 Accelerator. There are plenty of links to the show notes on moneyneversleeps.ie and how to get in touch, so don't hesitate to reach out. Finally, until next time, thanks for listening. See ya!